Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. In this episode, CSIAC subject matter experts will conduct a roundtable discussion of the risk management framework regarding step one, categorization, specifically focused on industrial control systems. Since this first step is the most important in the process, we will present this review in a multi-part series. This particular podcast will discuss the development of the security program. Welcome to a roundtable discussion of risk management framework. Today we'll be talking about step one categorization with a focus on industrial control systems. I'm your host, Stephen Brewster. And I'm Dr. Rampo Hollington. We chose a roundtable discussion because it provides the opportunity to hear a dialogue concerning risk management framework between two security professionals working in the industry. And we hope that you gain a lot from it, and we also hope to hear from you soon. In today's agenda, we're going to discuss these five areas. We're going to discuss the security program. We're going to discuss the to how to accurately identify the information types in your operating environment. We're going to talk about aligning the security objectives and why that's important. Mm. We're going to look at roles and responsibilities uh, within the risk management framework. And we're going to talk about the operating environment, which is critical to successfully navigating the risk management framework process. Yeah. We believe that these five key areas is everything you would possibly need in order to truly understand categorization. As we know, this is a multi-step process and step one is the most important of all. A security program. What is it? Oftentimes we step into this process as a system owner at the tier three level and we're challenged, we're faced with having to meet this mandate of risk management framework. No one has explained to us how we should go about it, what personnel we should be using, or what we should be looking for as an end result. Oftentimes, it's more like a set of deliverables, documents, and registration email, uh, websites, correct? Yeah. But, but I think oftentimes we miss the goal, the ultimate strategy of what Tier 1 DOD is trying to get and trying to obtain. And from what we've understood, it's really a, a security program, right? Yes. Okay. The, the ultimate goal of the risk management framework is, is to develop a security program hmm. which helps system owners and their staff to manage the risk to their environment. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we've looked at risk management framework with the ultimate goal of getting an ATO. If you develop a security program and you demonstrate that you're operating within the parameters of your security program, then an ATO will automatically follow. I feel that some of the system owners and some of the systems that are out there uh, navigating this process, they're trying to obtain an ATO and they miss the boat of developing a security program. So I understand that, right? I've seen, I've been in environments where uh, system owners uh, did not care to what extent risk was captured, uh, to whether or not uh, there was clear visibility into their environment, such as hiding vulnerabilities, hiding patches, not reporting everything, all because they're extremely focused. There's been contract constraints that says if we don't get an ATO by this date, we're gonna, the contract will end and they're gonna have to re-up. And so I understand that focus, but if a system owner is to change their perspective and start thinking about a security program, where should they start? In fact, what, what, what is a security program? Okay, well, to implement a security program, mm -hmm. you have to consider the people, processes, and technologies that you have in the environment. Okay. The, the technologies mm -hmm. are going to dictate the technical, pretty much the technical implementation mm -hmm. of whatever measures that you're going to put in place, mm -hmm. whether you have a firewall, mm -hmm. a router, or, or, or some server. Mm -hmm. There are settings that you're going to need to set on that to okay. make sure that um, you're, you're addressing risk in, mm -hmm. in your monitoring, auditing, or, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. the, the processes are going to help the system owner and their staff understand how to go about the day-to-day -day things, the things that need to be uh, uh, executed, mm -hmm. um, the frequency of how things are executed, okay. when things are executed, where things are stored, mm -hmm. um, how they go about managing the data. Marking day. data, marking documents, things right, like that. Okay. Right, and then, and then the people. The people are, are, are probably one of the, the most important elements of this entire process. Okay. Um, 
you, you need to make sure that your people have the proper training. Mm. Um, you don't have a Windows Server admin administering a uh, Red Hat environment that doesn't mm. have the proper training. Mm. So you want to make sure that the people that you have have the proper training mm. to function within your environment. Gotcha. You want to make sure that the people um, are properly vetted mm -hmm. to be in your environment. Mm. Well, in a security program, when you start looking at people, processes, and technologies, what kind of things should an industrial control systems owner consider? I, I think that's an interesting question because mm -hmm. all security professionals aren't equal. <laughs> right? Ain't you, that the truth? You have uh, security <laughs> professionals that traditionally work in mm -hmm. uh, Windows environments. Yeah. You have some that traditionally work in Linux environments. Mm -hmm. You have security professionals that are network engineers. Um, so so when, when uh, a system owner starts looking at the people, processes, and technologies, want to make sure he has the right people in his environment mm -hmm. to be able to administer his environment, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the network engineer that, that you get mm -hmm. within your environment understands more than just TCP IP networks, mm. right? They need to be able to understand some of the industrial control system protocols. Like BACnet and DMP and those types of things. Right. Okay. Understand those protocols and mm. how they operate within the environment, what levels it, within the Purdue model they operate at, mm. so they can properly engineer their, their environment and, and, and develop their environment gotcha. and put the right protection mechanisms in mm. place. Yeah. Um, what about processes? I mean, I would, I would assume that uh, if someone were to try and configure an industrial control system environment uh, in order to meet certain DOD standards, I don't think those configurations are going to be one to one. Not at all. Um, you'll, you'll find that within the industrial control system environment, there's many many of the the operating systems, if you will, mm -hmm. um, they're they're running embedded operating system with mm -hmm. limited space. Mm -hmm. um, they're uh, running in real time. Yeah. Um, so. Or a lot of their user configurations and access control is using some type of underlining operating system. And then that which is specific to the control system is some high, higher level application. Right. And so what that industrial control system system owner might be documenting for AC controls or for a, how they identify users is going to be a little bit different in that environment than it would be IT. Right. And, 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 you might and, not have standard cat cards in order to access a controller. And, and that's, that's important that you say that because yeah. what I've seen is that what, what, what some systems are trying to copy and paste mm -hmm. from an enterprise environment mm -hmm. because they got an ATO. Yeah. Because remember when we go back to the ultimate goal is not to get an ATO, it's to set up a security program specific to your environment. With people, process, well, and technology. Right. Okay. So when you start looking at mm -hmm. uh, other environments and their, how they manage uh, the AC family controls or the auditing controls, mm -hmm. and you try to bring that into your environment, mm -hmm. You're going to create issues because those control systems don't operate that way. Gotcha. You can't audit them the same way that you can audit a traditional uh, IT piece of equipment or a workstation or gotcha. a server. Yeah. Um, you can't install yeah. HIPs or right. antivirus right. on some of these environments without breaking the environment. Yeah. Or it's not even technically feasible to do. Right. So, so the system owner has to really get the people to understand mm. what this looks like. Gotcha. So that kind of shapes what that light at the tunnel is. It's not an ATO, right? The, the goal here is not looking to receive a, a, a digitally signed email. The goal now that I'm seeing is to develop a program that truly represents how this system operates and then communicate that said or manage that said cybersecurity risk up the chain through your AO and whatnot. Right. And, and you, you couldn't have said it better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to manage the risk mm -hmm. specific to your environment. Mm -hmm. And that how you manage that risk mm -hmm. is your security program, mm -hmm. which is the blueprint. Nice. Which is the blueprint in order for your system to function against the current and future threats to, to that environment. Yeah, you know, uh, I've seen several situations where uh, there's a security breach, it's nationwide, affects both private and public sector, and, you know, DISA responds in kind and sends out IAVA bulletins and IAVA alerts in order to try to get that vulnerability risk uh, 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 minimized across the entire dome, right? We've seen them with various browsers, our Internet Explorer, things of that nature. Uh, various protocols. 
but when it comes to control systems, that function and respond, I, I, my experience shows that it doesn't go hand in hand with a disability. I mean, some of the vulnerabilities that are affecting this control system are extremely unique and really doesn't affect any other part of the Doden except for those that are using a specific type of technology by a specific vendor. What is your experience or how do you see this? Well, it's um, as, as, as uh, Department of Defense mm -hmm. uh, really embraces the control system. And, 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 and as you know, control systems are, are required to go through the RMF process. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a component mm -hmm. that also has to be brought into the strategic mm -hmm. approach to RMF from a control system standpoint, mm -hmm. and that's the uh, ICSR. Yeah. Um, they, they, they publish the bulletins that mm -hmm. are specific to control systems, mm -hmm. um, specific to certain vendors and, mm -hmm. and certain protocols that operate within those environments. Gotcha. Um, and again, we go back, it, this is full circle, people, processes, and technologies, the people that you have in your environment mm -hmm. have to understand that those things exist. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, and where to go find that information yeah. to be able to help you manage the risk to your environment. Right, and integrate those different uh, organizations into your processes. I mean, a lot of times, you, we, you know, I've seen where Microsoft and Cisco and Juniper, uh, even VMware, uh, have standard configuration guides um, they also publish standard um, uh, security risks that are identified by either private um, analysts or in-house. They publish that to the DOD. DOD then publishes that out, publish that, publishes it through some type of IAVA, and thus the Doden is impacted, right? But when it comes to products developed by Honeywell or Johnson Controls or other uh, types of industrial control system vendors, that same level of visibility isn't following that pipeline. Right. It's following a completely different pipeline. Um, and, and processes in order to ensure that that risk is known and mitigated in a timely manner. I've seen it, it should and does require maintenance agreements or some other type of, uh, of established service agreement with those vendors directly. And, and, and if a security program is to be the light at the end of the tunnel, these are things that have to be considered during step one categorization or we'll miss the boat. Right. We'll miss the boat on developing that program. And, and you will have gaps in your security program um, where, where these risks will either have to be accepted or forced to be accepted yeah. by the AO, mm -hmm. or um, they'll, they'll be ongoing mm -hmm. um, and you'll, you, you'll have the, this hole in your program that um, will keep your, your systems vulnerable. Yeah, 100%. 100%. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.